We're Howard and Kaylin Newstate, full-time travelers and RVers for three years, and this is our second trip to Alaska by RV. And today we're going to be sharing seven tips to help you prepare for your own Alaskan RV adventure. Okay, let's get started. Tip number one, make sure you allow enough time both for the drive up as well as for exploring Alaska. We unfortunately didn't take our own advice in 2019 and did the drive in, I think it was seven days, which was still very expedited. If you're looking for some recommendations on great places to stop along the way, we do have another video that we made on that. And then what happened in 2021, Howard? <laughs> We did it in 57 hours, but that was because of COVID restrictions. In a normal year, there is so much to see, so much to explore. You don't need to rush. We had to rush in order to get up here in an expedited manner. But what if you can't or don't want to do the drive up to Alaska? There are still options. First up, and a great option, is the Alaska Marine Highway System, or the ferry. While your RV is being transported below, you're up top enjoying the sights and scenery of the Inside Passage, which is a beautiful area and something we still haven't gotten to do ourselves. So maybe we'll take the ferry back. The other option is to ship your RV to Alaska and then you can fly up, and we've had friends who have done this. There's one option that's an open air cargo ship or a roll on roll off option where your RV is enclosed inside the ship. And the third option is you don't bring your RV at all. You fly up and you rent one. There are lots and lots of RVs up here. Uh, some from large commercial operators and even the kind of Airbnb style where you can rent someone else's RV. There's all different classes, all different sizes, and there are even people that do travel trailers and fifth wheels. And that has been a very popular option this summer. We have seen so many of those rental RVs here. Yeah, particularly because of the fact that the ferry is completely sold out for RVs all the way through September of 2021. Yeah, so if you're planning for 2022 and that's an option, you probably wanna go ahead and make your reservation as soon as possible. It's getting kind of chilly. <laughs> Tip number two is all about using books instead of connectivity for planning and finding things like gas stations, then also preparing your RV. Are we really about to recommend books? Yes. <laughs> I know, I understand that in this age, you can look at your phone and usually find any information you need, whether it's from an app or from online with a Google search. But when you're dealing with limited connectivity, like up here, sometimes for days or even hours at a time, your cell phone is not going to work. And speaking of connectivity, just plan on not having connectivity sometimes or enjoying the conversation of the people you're traveling with. We found through travel that there is no perfect solution. There's not one carrier that has service everywhere. And in fact, there are very large areas of Alaska and Northern Canada that do not have service at all. That spot was beautiful, no cell service. For us, it's a combination of using AT&T, T-Mobile, which actually roams on a local carrier called GCI, and then sometimes Verizon. But if you're the kind of person like us who needs connectivity for work, just know it's going to be a struggle sometimes and you may not be able to travel as fast or as frequently as you would like. So let's get back to the books. Most people are aware of the milepost, which is like the holy grail of information if you're an RVer or traveling by car throughout the great state of Alaska and along all of the roadways that lead to Alaska. Milepost, if you're not familiar, gets its name because of the structure of the book. It lists in excruciating detail every minor or major thing that you can find along the roadways organized by mile markers, hence the milepost. But that level of detail is also possibly its greatest weakness. When you need to find something quickly, it can be very difficult to find in the milepost. Another great resource that we have found helpful, and we use all of these together in tandem, is Mike and Terry Church's Traveler's Guide to Alaskan Camping. This book has camping, fuel stops, information about different locations, everything you could possibly need if you're RVing or camping here in Alaska. But the award for the most abbreviated guide goes to Tourism Dawson Creek for their single-page, double-sided guide to the Alaska Highway. It is located at mile zero. You can pick up your own copy and it shows every campground, fuel station, and major city along the entire route. Lucky for you, I scanned a copy of it in 2019 and you can download it at the link below. All of those books and guides do make reference to road conditions and that's a major topic within the RV world. Will my rig get destroyed if I make the trip up to Alaska? We've done it twice now. Our rig is still here and in great condition. In fact, in 2019, we did the drive up on our stock suspension and the original tires. We have since upgraded our suspension because we do a lot of off-grid camping and we wanted just a smoother ride when we were traversing some of those forest roads and that has helped a lot. So we will say that making the drive back up in 2021 was not quite as rocking and rolling as 2019. 
And what we're really referring to are frost heaves. <laughs> frost heaves are not something that most of us are familiar with, but it's kind of a situation of freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing causes the road to dip and rise up. And what you end up with is a recipe for a disaster if you hit it way too fast. So if you take your time and you look ahead on the road, you can typically spot them from a distance. The Alaskan and Canadian governments do a great job of marking as many of them as they can. They'll typically put pink flag, which you'll see on the side of the road. And if you see one of those, definitely slow down. And a recent upgrade we made, actually while we're here in Alaska, was to replace our traditional batteries with lithium. Now, if you're boondockers like us, or people who like to really go off the grid and not necessarily stay in campgrounds, this was a major upgrade for us. Now, we did it as reasonably priced as we could, and we'll have more details on that later, but suffice it to say, we love our new batteries. And when you have so much sunlight, which we'll get to in a minute, it is great for solar. Tip number three, Alaska requires pet health certificates for dogs, cats, and ferrets. <laughs> yep, ferrets, so if that's your thing. If you're like us, traveling with your furry friends is part of what makes RV life so spectacular, being able to take them to all of these cool places and have wonderful experiences with them. But just know that you will have to have a specific form when you're entering Alaska. Canada does not require it, but they do require proof of rabies vaccine. We have never been asked for it, but you must have it. And it's always good practice to travel with their up-to-date vaccination records in the first place. But back to the form, all of the information can be found at the link in the description of this video, but just be sure that your vet is not using the downloadable form. Each health certificate has to have a specific trackable ID on it, and it has to be issued within 30 days of when you're planning to cross the border into Alaska with your animal. Tip number four, in addition to lots of campgrounds, you really can camp almost anywhere on Alaskan public lands. We're coming to you right now from a beautiful free campsite. We've got water, we've got mountains, we've got pontoon planes flying overhead. <laughs> Amazing. There are definitely some places that you're going to want to plan ahead and make reservations for. For example, if you're camping inside Denali National Park, that tends to book out months in advance. So you'll want to get those planned. Another one is one of our favorite destinations, Seward. They recently implemented a mostly reservation only system. So if you happen to be there over a weekend or a major holiday, like, like 4th of July, like we were, you probably are not going to be able to snag camping right on the water. And that's a great place that you're going to want to stay in the campground for. Another ideal spot that might require advanced planning is the Homer Spit. This awfully named but beautiful spot is where a lot of the dining, shopping, and all the excursions take place from Homer. There's public camping available on the spit, but it is all first come, first serve. If you're the kind of person, or if you have a very limited amount of time, you might want to consider getting reservations at several of the private campgrounds that are also located on the spit. Alaska really is a great state to try a variety of camping styles. Everything from camping in a campground to boondocking off grid, you can sleep by beautiful lakes, rivers, mountains, it's incredible. Tip number five, be prepared to pay a bit more for most things, but prices in Anchorage and Fairbanks are very close to what they are in the lower 48 states. If you just can't get enough of Costco, Fred Meyer, which is Kroger, Target, Best Buy, they are all located in Anchorage. Where you'll start to see the major price difference is when it comes to fresh produce. And it makes sense when you think about how far all of it has to travel to get here. A great example, we recently paid $6 for two avocados. Bananas here right now are on average like 89 to 99 cents a pound. And when I did a search for the lower 48, they were about 60 cents a pound. So that's where you'll see a little bit more. Another thing though is the restaurants. If you plan to dine out, and we highly do recommend this because the cuisine here is fabulous. I mean, there's so much fresh fish and all kinds of yumminess that you're going to want to eat out at these restaurants, but they have higher prices. And some of that is because of the limited season. If you think about it, Alaska really only operates for tourists from June through September. That means when you only have three to four months, you have to make all of your revenue in that short period of time. That also makes things a lot more difficult for logistics. As a result, you are going to pay more when you dine out. But in our opinion, it's totally worth it. I need a fire. <laughs> fire pit right here. I need to fire it up. Tip number six, <laughs> be prepared for almost 24 hours straight of daylight. Going for a little sunset walk at 11 o'clock at night. Still need my sunglasses this late. Now, there are pluses and minuses to this. As a positive, we can recharge the batteries really fast for a long period of time via solar power. That's wonderful. But a negative, 
<laughs> trying to sleep. If you're a light sleeper like I am, it is a bit of an adjustment period. We have blackout shades in our RV, which helps tremendously. And then I utilize the sleep mask. And once I have that thing on, it's like it's pitch black and I can go to sleep no problem. So that's my uh, hot tip for us light sleepers. I will also share that Scout the dog really struggles with this. For the first month, she really could not adjust to the concept of it's four o'clock in the morning and it's bright as day. Like this. Is it time to get up? The answer is no, it is not time to get up. And she sleeps in the bathroom. We actually put her bed inside the shower. And so there's a big skylight overhead. There's not much we can do about that to block it out. And so unfortunately, it took her a long time to adjust. Another positive though is you can hike well into the evening. We recently did a hike at 9 30, 10 o'clock at night. There was hardly anybody on the trail and it was absolutely beautiful out. And there are so many other things you can do late into the evening. For example, if you're looking for that free campsite, you can drive. We did. We actually parked one time and it was over, what, almost midnight before we landed <laughs> at our final site. It's not something that we have ever been able to do in the lower 48, that's for sure. We don't like to get to places when it's already dark. So this definitely helps. Tip number seven, you don't have to do it alone. We get it. Some people are overwhelmed by these types of planning activities, particularly when you're talking about excursions lasting a month or two months in a very remote location. Well, lucky for those people, there's Winnebago Outdoor Adventures <laughs> and they run caravans. And those caravans take care of all the planning for you. You're traveling with a larger group, so they handle all of the excursions, activities, even dining, and you don't have to worry about anything at all and you get to reap the benefits of exploring a beautiful location. So that's seven tips and the tip of the iceberg <laughs> when it comes to planning your adventure through Alaska by RV. But what questions do you have? Put them in the comments below. We'll try and answer as many of them as we can. And we'll have so much more to share from our summer here in Alaska. Thanks so much for watching. See you soon.